The Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Ottitune. Learn how to automatically optimise your MySQL and Postgres configurations at ottitune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hi guys, uh, welcome to another talk of the Vaccination Data Seminar Series. We're happy today to have Dr. Ido Liberty, who is the founder and CEO of Pinecone, a vector database that he's going to tell us about today. Um, prior to that, he was the director of research at, at Amazon uh, and the head of the a a Amazon AI Labs. Before that, he was senior research director at uh, Yahoo. Um, and then prior to that, he, he got his PhD out of Yale University. So as always, if you have any questions during the talk, please unmute yourself, say who you are, and, and ask your question and feel free to do this at any time so that Ido doesn't feel like he's talking to himself. Um, oh. And with that, Ido, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Appreciate the invitation. Uh, and uh, very happy to uh, uh, virtually back, be back at CMU. I've been there many times, uh, mostly at the CS department, but uh, nevertheless. Uh, I want to talk to you about uh, vector databases. And uh, this talk is really, it really isn't about uh, the applications of them or the commercial viability or the use case, but really like diving deep into how they're built and what's challenging about building them and why it's interesting for somebody who's uh, an engineer or a scientist to, to care. And uh, I hope, uh, uh, I hope uh, that makes sense. So. I will start uh, nonetheless with uh, saying what it is, because otherwise it becomes very hard uh, to uh, dive deeper. So uh, we as a community uh, have, uh, by and large, the search engines and databases have done uh, something relatively simple in the sense that the objects that we care about are text, tables, integers, strings, you know, maybe objects like JSON and so on. But they are, by and large, relatively simple objects. And uh, the qu questions that we were able to ask us uh, to answer efficiently were actually relatively simple questions. Does uh, what documents contain what words? You know, what what records uh, answer some you know some predicate? Uh, you know, what you know what uh, you know, records fit fit some some logical filter and so on. Uh, they, these things are incredibly hard to build efficiently at its scale and so on. This entire seminar and this entire, uh, you know, endeavor is, you know, and many hundreds of companies are dedicated to doing that efficiently. I, I'm not trying to belittle that. That's incredibly important. Uh, but for 80% of the world, of the world's data, uh, that doesn't fit. You know, if you have long pieces of natural language, natural spoken languages, images, and so on, they don't fit the pattern. And if you have, you want to answer complex questions, you know, give me everything that means something or is similar to something else. That, that is a complicated question and it's, it doesn't fit into an SQL query. Okay. Uh, and so uh, interestingly, the answer uh, has emerged. You know, we have wanted to do this for many years. It's not like people didn't want to answer complex questions uh, 30 years ago. We just didn't know really how to do it. And today we are, uh, uh, we are pairing up machine learning models that create uh, special representations of objects as vectors and vector databases as the engine that drives search and retrieval off of that type of data as basically the de facto uh, winning uh, 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 paradigm on, on how to address those issues, right? And so if you look at the adoption of uh, of different technologies, uh, I'll, I'll take Apache Druid as a benchmark. If you, on the right-hand side, you see a number of uh, GitHub stars uh, as a function of time. GitHub stars is a pretty poor surrogate for adoption or usage, but they're some surrogate nonetheless. Uh, and I take Druid because it's it's something that I, I, I it's a cool technology that I like. I, I think it's, it's a good, uh, it's a very good piece of software. It has a very healthy adoption, a good community. Uh, and it's growing very healthily and supporting a lot of uh, business and, and news cases. If you look at uh, 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 something like Face and BERT, which I'll explain in a second what they are, they're growing, they started later and they're growing significantly faster. So what are people doing with it? They're taking sentences in English or any other language. They're using a machine learning model, in this case, something BERT, which is the yellow line. 
They convert that to a high dimensional vector, in this case, uh, 768 dimensions, and feed that into a vector index, in this case, face, which is the Facebook AI similarity search library, which is the blue line on the right, okay? And that model has repeated itself, that not model is the Burke model, but uh, this pa paradigm, this pattern has repeated itself, uh, I don't know how many times across the industry, and uh, uh, you know, with different models and different uh, vector indexes in different applications. Okay, so that the open source sphere has, in some sense, uh, solidified about this being the right pattern. More than that, uh, the bigger companies have already voted that this is the by far the, the winning strategy. Right. So if you look at if you search on Google today uh, with a long uh, question or something that that the, the text search engine can already detect that is going to give you very poor results. What they're doing is they, they search by meaning uh, and use vector search behind the scenes to actually retrieve answers or compli complex results. When you shop on Amazon, you might look for a full outfit uh, and you might get some stuff. Uh, and that's not because the words full and outfit uh, were in the description of the, of the products. Uh, they were, they, they seemed like a good, match and the way that happens is because neither the neither the product nor your query are represented as keywords or, or JSONs. They're represented as high dimensional uh, vectors that come out of the machine learning models. And if you you know you browse Facebook, then your feed is organized again based on your preferences and your uh, behavior. Uh, and that is again the same kind of pattern. You yourself and your behavior are encoded as this machine learning uh, representation of your preferences uh, in uh, items are, are uh, uh, searched through a vector index, okay? And so this is going to be my, uh, my uh, one and only slide as a, as a CEO. Uh, I wanna say that uh, Pinecone is, is pioneering this uh, uh, kind of database in the, in, a, in, the, uh, in the SaaS category around it. We've built three, uh, uh, you know, conceptually separate parts uh, of the database, even though they're very uh, closely related and, of course, uh, operated uh, uh, together. Of course, it's the vector index itself, uh, which needs to be, of course, fast and accurate. Uh, it needs to contain uh, what's called filtering, which I'll talk about in a second. And of course, it needs to be very efficient, so you can uh, you can get a lot of hardware cost reduction, uh, which, of course, we roll over to our customers. Otherwise, there's no point in, in having a database to begin with. You have to then uh, have a cloud database, so you have a uh, scale the whole thing, care about ingestion, uh, care about high availability, load balancing, you know, separating storage from compute, you know, horizontal scaling and replication and so on. And finally, uh, managing uh, security, resource provisioning, access control, product management, the whole nine yards, okay? Um, we have uh, been recently uh, uh, identified, uh, I mean, called out by, by Gardner as a cool vendor. And, and you know, a lot of the venues have uh, uh, talked about our product and, and uh, what it does for the uh, uh, community and, and businesses writ large. So uh, for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna talk only about the top point. So I'm gonna only focus on the vector index uh, and, the, and, the, and the core of the database. I won't talk about any other thing. I don't, you know, security is very important, but it's, it's not a part of this seminar and I, 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 uh, I believe this is not the, what you guys would be interested in. That is correct. The, the cloud data is just like, whatever, it stores themselves in S3 EDS. Right, so that, the, that the, yeah, I mean, it's not, uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, yeah. I mean, right. approach. It, it's more, it's more standard. Uh, it's still yeah. a lot of work, but it's, it's uh, that's not where the, the, the secret sauce is. Uh, so just as a very, a uh, rough uh, kind of mental model of what we're trying to achieve uh, or what is possible with Pinecone today. And then I'll, I'll dive in. Uh, so this is uh, Zeus, uh, is uh, the, the, our uh, director of products pet and uh, uh, a really uh, cute dog. Uh, I can attest to that. Uh, not only Dave thinks that. Um, and uh, Dave wanted to find his siblings. And so he, not, I mean, jokingly his siblings, like other uh, dogs like him, uh, so he downloaded a, a, a data set of, I think, 200,000 images of dogs uh, and upserted their embeddings with the computer vision model into Pinecone as the vector representations, and then searched for the top five results in terms of similarity 
to the vector embedding. Uh, and the results were these other dogs from, from this collection, right? And so you can see that the similarities in terms of content of the image and the meaning of the image and not uh, pixel similarity or some other metadata related. The search is on the image itself. Make sense? So, all right. Uh, by the way, it's much more common to uh, do this with text uh, and language, but uh, text and language doesn't uh, don't lend themselves uh, to such uh, nice uh, visuals. So it's easier to talk about images. Okay. So that, with that out of the way, I want to immediately jump into uh, what is a vector index uh, and how does it uh, work. So. I want to have a recap of uh, Machine Learning 101. I don't know if you've, uh, I think all of you have uh, seen this uh, mental model of a linear classifier that kind of divides the space between uh, positive and negative examples. And you can think about the vector embeddings of the images of, of dogs as really the features of the image, right? And you can think about training a linear classifier, which is uh, basically these weights uh, QI, Okay, and this parameter B, such that if you sum up the coordinates xi, so these are, uh, let's say uh, you have a, a thousand coordinates here. So each, each image is represented by a thousand dimensional vector. Then if you sum up the, uh, you know, this, the dot product basically between your query or the, whatever this classifier Q and your point X, uh, if that is greater than some threshold B, then you're on the right, upper side of the, of the space, and maybe you'll classify it as a white Labrador. Uh, and maybe if you're in the lower the bottom part of this uh, plot, then you're categorized as not the Labrador, not the white Labrador, okay? So that is, that is a machine learning uh, uh, concept that you can uh, learn, right? But uh, like in uh, database uh, as a whole, you know, your job is to retrieve the things that classify correctly or that, that meet the predicate efficiently and not compute everything in brute force. So let me maybe go back to the first slide. I can easily figure out all the white Labradors by just computing xi, this x times q parameters everywhere. But I would have to scan through the entire data. I would have to compute d different coordinates uh, times n uh, 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 items in my data. So that's n times d. Okay, so I, I can scan my entire data and, and, and figure out which lie, which point lies on which side of this hyperplane, uh, but that would be incredibly heavy. And so in, in vector databases, uh, you kind of have to get used to the idea that a query is a classifier. What do I mean by that? Uh, in a traditional database, uh, you basically have a predicate, right? And the predicate takes a, a record and it tells a Boolean. And your job is to be able to return everything that returns true very efficiently, right? In, uh, in vector databases, you get the high dimensional vector and you return a Boolean, right? That pattern of a function is called a classifier. That's what classifiers do. They take a, they take a, uh, a they map vectors to Booleans. So yes, no, like this is the label, right? It's a Boolean, it's a binary classifier, right? And so, <laughs> Your query really is a, 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 a classifier, and the result of the query uh, is uh, everything that classifies as true with this classifier. Now, you can't have very general classifiers. This is a very hard problem, but you can deal with linear classifiers. You can deal with what's called cone uh, uh, regions, which are usually uh, known as cosine similarity. So cones are just, uh, you know, you, you point some direction in space and look for everything inside some, you know, with some angular distance away from that ray, or maybe a ball uh, region, which uh, corresponds to Euclidean distance, which is like uh, you put a point in space and you say everything within some radius around this uh, point in space, uh, that which is also very common for, uh, you know, things like similarity search or dissimilarity search. So these are the kinds of queries you wanna be able to answer. Does that make sense? All right. Note that the me. object, go on. It, it makes sense to me. I guess it, does anybody else have any questions? Right, so note that right off the bat, we have completely abandoned uh, uh, SQL, 
uh, and even NoSQL, and we're in a completely different domain where we deal with a very new kind of type of data. Okay, so we make like, the whole, you know, uh, you know, this is this is the core of what we're trying to do. Okay, so I want to say that intuitively, uh, it, people, it's it's kind of hard to understand why this is hard at the beginning, because our our minds are, are used to like uh, two or three dimensional spaces. Uh, um, in which things like divide and conquer work really, really well. So in one dimension, you can split the, the space in half, or like you split your, split your parameter space in half, uh, and you get two sections, right? In 2D, if you split every coordinate in half, you get uh, four sections. In 3D, you get eight sections. <coughs> and that's still very efficient. And so, uh, you know, uh, geospatial databases do exactly this, right? They, they partition the space uh, geometrically uh, in 3D. Uh, but uh, if you look at the uh, NLP example that I showed you before, the output of BERT is 768 dimension, uh, dimensional. And so if you uh, see how many sections you have created by splitting every coordinate, that's more than the number of atoms in the universe, okay? And so clearly the branching factor is, is completely ludicrous and, and you can't really uh, operate that way. So any kind of naive partitioning of the space is just gonna blow up in your face immediately, okay? As kind of a social proof that this is uh, again hard, there are tens or hundreds of algorithms out there uh, that have uh, many internal parameters to tune and they keep competing with each other on which one is faster or more accurate uh, on which data set. Uh, and, the result, uh, and the results are uh, really dependent on the kind of data that you have. So this is another level of complexity that even just a specific set of data that you have uh, really dictates uh, uh, which kind of index you should be using. Okay. So, uh, for the next uh, about 20-ish uh, meetings uh, minutes, I want to maybe 25 minutes. I want to spend on uh, the core ideas uh, behind uh, these algorithms uh, and some of the thinking behind them. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the idea, we're going to talk about the internal workings of what a vector database, what a vector index even looks like. So uh, going back to the early works of, uh, you know, Piotr Indyk, Alex Andoni, and uh, others before him, uh, kind of in parallel, like uh, Yuval Rabani and uh, Rafael Ostrovsky, uh, Eyal Kushilevitz, and others. Uh, they've looked at this uh, question of how do we... Uh, how do we partition the space in a way that, that actually makes sense for the data and that we can argue against? And uh, I think Moses Charikar actually came up with this proof that I'm going to show you, which is, is I think, fascinating. So think about two points uh, in space, two vectors in space that have some angle between them. No matter, it doesn't matter what the, that angle is. And think what happens to the, uh, your space if you cut uh, the entire... Uh, the, cut, cut the entire space in half by a random hyperplane that goes to the origin, okay? So now a random hyperplane in high dimension, if, sorry, if you look at these two vectors, you can always, you can always take two vectors and align them on a two-dimensional plane. In some sense, that's the, that's the definition of a two-dimensional plane, right? So we can always rotate those points and, and make them fit this joint. So this isn't a caricature, this is actually what's happening, right? And so you can ask yourself, where does a random hyperplane cut this hyperplane, this two-dimensional plane, and that is in the random angle, right? That makes sense, uniformly random, okay? And now the only ask, you only need to ask the question, uh, how likely it is that this random cut is gonna split those two points? So they line in uh, different sides of, of, of that hyperplane. And the answer is exactly proportional to the angle. So of course, if they're exactly the same point, uh, they will always lie on, on the same side. And if they're 180 degrees apart, they will always lie on separate sides. Uh, and if they're 90 degrees apart, it's, it's, it'll be 50-50. And so it's obvious that you're just, it's just proportional to the angle between them, right? And so 
now you can boost this idea and say, okay, what happens if I cut not once, but maybe 10 times, then each point is actually uh, uh, converted to this like uh, two to the 10, oh, like a 10 bit hash value, right? Which bakes into it this really nice property that I can mathematically say, I can mathematically calculate the probability of, of uh, two points having exa the exact same hash based on, on how, what's the angle between them. So it kind of, it, it translates geometry to this uh, hash collision, uh, uh, you know, calculus, right? And so now you can boost that, right? And say, okay, I won't hash every point to just like one bucket, but I'll, I'll hash every vector to a, a bunch of buckets. And I'll make sure that, uh, uh, I can boost the probability such that if two things are close enough, and by close enough, I mean close enough by, by my definition of close enough, uh, in angle wise, uh, they will collide with high probability, which means that we we'll look for them in the same bins, which kind of starts converting something like uh, a, a geometric search to a, uh, a, like an inverted index. Okay, so you, th you should think about the terms as these like uh, bucket IDs. Okay, so this is LSH. Uh, incredibly powerful and mathematically beautiful idea. Alas, uh, it's it's considered in some sense uh, 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 not great just because it, it's not very efficient. It's not very efficient because it doesn't use the statistics and the geometry of the given data. You, you cut stuff with random hyperplanes. Uh, uh, and we know that now that we can do better by clustering. So if you take the data that you have, and you cluster it uh, into points that are geometrically close to each other, uh, you can ask, you can say, well, I, I don't know, um, well, this isn't perfect, but you know, I can maybe take the, the blue point on the top left and say, okay, this is a surrogate for all the points around it. And if that uh, fits the, uh, or maybe the right uh, hand, top right, uh, and maybe if that fits, if that meets my condition, then I can go in and search for all the points inside the same cell and maybe they'll, they'll, uh, uh, they'll conform uh, as well. Uh, now note that this is already not perfect. So the, on the bottom right, you see a, a center that, that met the predicate, you know, which is a good fit, but then some of the points in, in, the, in the cluster don't uh, meet the requirement, uh, in which case you've just wasted some compute uh, and then there's the cell next to it, the red one, uh, which is uh, some points are actually included in the, in the should be returned, but they're not. So that's a recall loss. So now we already are seeing that there's things are becoming a little bit complex because now you're already having the idea of approximation, the idea of a loss. Okay, you can, you can already see that you, you have to get comfortable with the idea that this database is already approximated in the sense that it will not return some points that it should have. Now, if you, if, you don't get, if, you, if you don't allow for that, then you really can't get any acceleration or improvement, okay? Um, uh, did I miss a slide? I think there's a slide missing here. Okay, uh, I don't know what happened here, but... Uh, all right, so I'll, I'll talk over the slide that's missing. Uh, note that to figure out what to do here, okay, I have all the points are the, the uh, red, you know, the, the, the circles, and the X's are the cluster centers, right? I basically need to compute the, uh, the, uh, the dot product or the, the, the uh, I have to evaluate the predicate, the geometric predicate. For the, for the classifier, in this case, the red diagonal line and the center, I have to compute that for every center. And the question is, well, can you get away from that? Because maybe you have many, many centers. You might have tens of thousands of centers. Uh, and the answer is, is yes. And you can actually create this like uh, navigation graph of, uh, on, uh, on points. such so you start from a random center, from a random point in your data, and you say, I'll, I'll advance to the next center that improves and something that gets closer to meeting the requirement of the predicate, right? Or gets close, moves in the right direction or gets close to the point that I'm getting closer to. Um, and you do that and you can uh, actually organize it in hierarchies. So you take bigger steps for first and then smaller steps and, and the smallest steps at the bottom, kind of like IP routing or uh, 
or uh, you know, the, the postal service, right? So you kind of send to the right state and then the right city and then the right neighborhood and so on, okay? Uh, incredibly powerful uh, and, and, uh, and uh, kind of a, a nice idea. Uh, I can tell you that uh, uh, it has been performing really, really well in practice uh, and kind of uh, uh, generalizes the idea of a skip list. But uh, mathematically, it actually uh, it kind of falls uh, short in a, in, a, in a serious way. And so it does really, really well on some data sets and it does really horribly badly on, on others. Oh, that's a slide that's missing. Okay, I don't know what happened, it just moved around. Okay, uh, we can skip that now. Okay, so now we have... Uh, just, just, just be clear, like, you're showing us different ways you could do this and, and, that, and you're explaining why they're insufficient, is that correct? I'm explaining um, different ideas. No, they're not insufficient, they're all good ideas, they're all used in practice. Uh, I am, uh, uh, maybe I should have said this in the beginning of the talk, I'm, I'm more interested in showing uh, what exists and what's hard and interesting than trying to tell you that what Pinecone is doing is right. Uh, I okay. don't, you know, I, I uh, we can, I'm happy to discuss that, but it's, it's uh, uh, for me, it's a lot more illuminating to figure out what's what's hard, what's interesting, and what we can, as a community, can try to achieve together. And you know, if you ask us, you know, what what does Pinecone do? Then Pinecone does all of this. Uh, but as a, you know, nobody really knows how to do this correctly. Like we're all we're all in this together. We we don't really have a good answer to uh, pretty much any of those questions. By we, I don't mean Pinecone. I mean like the world. Yes, I understand. All right, so, so like you're saying, you 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 are doing LSH, LSH, and some other We're things. Like, right, uh, yeah. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, so I have a I'll that. go on. Uh, is it like uh, you know the, some of these techniques work better for certain scale of data, like like LSH? If uh, like does it like fail at one billion data set sizes with certain dimensional, like whatever the dimensions uh, we may come up with, or PQ works better, like, do we have a sense of that? Um, the answer is, um, uh, we know, uh, uh, yeah, yes and no. So there are some data sets that we know, I mean, specific data sets that we know that one does better than the other by a big margin. Um, it isn't so cut and dry on just like, oh, high dimension, low dimension, many points, fewer points. It's a lot more nuanced than that. So I can't give you like a post-it size answer to what makes one better than the other. Got it, thank you. Uh, so uh, the, the techniques that I showed above uh, kind of uh, uh, are, are more focused on reducing the number of points that you are searching over. So this, this would have been like the, inverted index portion of, of the of the of the database right so or the posting list or whatever so this is uh, so you try to reduce the number of things that you scan or the number of objects that you look at now we'll, we'll, we're uh, kind of uh, changing gears to say okay now that I've, I've found maybe a region or a cluster or a subset of points that I, I want to consider can I scan through them more efficiently can I now actually compute? Instead of computing the full dot product in, in, uh, with D floating point multiplication additions, can I do less and somehow get away with discarding uh, points as, as you know, not a match with, with some uh, high degree of certainty? Uh, the, uh, one of the, method, one of the uh, standard methods is called product quantization. What happens, I take a, maybe a thousand dimensional vector I chunk it up to maybe 100 sections of length 10. So this is like 10 flows each. Uh, and each, I'll actually do clustering on each one of those 10 dimensional sections and uh, basically round off every 10 dimensional section to its nearest neighbors, okay? Um, and then uh, when I compute the quantization in real time, when I, so when I compute dot products in real time, instead of uh, actually doing the dot product, I will, for these hundred sections that I have for the thousand dimensional vector, I will just keep the, the ID of the center that it, it maps to. So now I have a huge compression. So I've now, instead of a thousand floats, 
I have a hundred ints and those ints are short ints. So they might be like eight bit and in ints. Uh, so this is a big compression. And then the dot product is computed incredibly efficiently because now you can, in real time, when you get the query, you can just figure out each section where it maps to or how much, how, you know, what's the dot product with each one of the centers. Populate a list of, of values. And then, uh, in, and then the, the uh, approximate dot product becomes a lookup and an add. Okay. And if the lookup table is tiny and you can fit it in, in, in one of the, you know, uh, one of the, you know, smallest caches you have, or maybe sometimes in actual registers, then this becomes incredibly efficient. So now you've converted the problem of multi, uh, float computation and addition uh, to uh, uh, very efficient lookups and, and adds of, of floats. Okay, you can actually convert those to integers as well, which, which also helps in some sense, but uh, this is getting too far. Um, interestingly, there, there are some uh, even further work. Uh, the, 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 um, in each one of those sections, each one of those ideas that I'm telling you about, by the way, is like tens of academic papers, sometimes hundreds, experiments and thoughts and optimizations and so on. These are like broad ideas that people are, are working on. Uh, and uh, one other thing that, that is incredibly potent and, and important is that um, we've been trying to approximate these dot products and distances so that we can we can uh, apply those queries faster but note that uh, we don't really it's there's not all results are are created equal uh, for example if i'm if uh, uh, some point is very very far away from from the center of the ball that i care about I might actually, I might not actually care about gauging that distance very accurately. I just want to know that it's too far for me to care about. Okay, and so somehow the the you you care to get a good approximation only the to points that you might actually return. So only to things that might actually be a part of the result set. Otherwise, I mean your approximation is 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 meaningless because why would you care? Okay. That creates a very tight coupling between the query distribution and the point distribution. And uh, if you do that, you mathematically you can actually figure out that the right thing to do is not actually cluster points to the nearest cluster center. And in fact, the cluster center should not be at the center at all. It should be somewhere else, right? Which is very surprising, uh, but uh, nonetheless true. And if you do that correctly, you you improve rounding and you improve the statistical. Uh, uh, behavior of, of your uh, of your index, and just to point that this is still work in progress, and uh, this is very active. And I say we don't know everything, but I mean really the world. This is a product. Uh, this is a, a paper I'm, I'm publishing with uh, Ditya Krishna, a, a, a PhD student from Johns Hopkins, uh, really on on how to do this at, at scale and, and use projective clustering to actually get all of these uh, anisotropic allocations correctly and, and boosted. <clears throat> and you get you know, again like a five ten percent uh, boost over the, uh, uh, the the previous uh, best known result. Okay, so in uh, I'll uh, yeah I'll, I'll just wrap up with just checking how I am on time. Okay, I need to accelerate a little bit. So if you thought if you're uh, uh, if you thought this was already kind of uh, getting a bit complex. Obviously, now you have to com to combine those two techniques. So now you have to search through fewer chunks of data, and within every chunk, you have to compute more efficiently, right? And so now you really have to combine the clustering and the and the and the and the acceleration in, in PQ and other types of compression, uh, and that you know, of course, uh, you know, uh, makes everything a lot more complex, and uh, you know, there's a lot more to tune and, and get right. Uh, finally, uh, you wanna you're gonna you're gonna uh, really mess things up uh, with the fact that we don't only want to answer traditional vector search queries, but we really have to figure out how to uh, how to uh, combine them with traditional uh, more uh, SQL or no SQL uh, queries, right? So, for example, if you're a retailer and you look for uh, items that you might uh, recommend. Uh, then uh, that's great, but you don't want to recommend something that's not in stock, right? 
Um, and so you really have to filter on, on hard rules as, oh, I, 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 you know, yes, I want the most, uh, you know, relevant content, but it has to be like, uh, whatever, uh, uh, you know, rated correctly for the viewer and, and stuff like that. <clears throat> so you can have two different, uh, approaches. One of them is to first filter, uh, with your traditional like posting list solution. Uh, um, Sorry, the, the, what people have tried to do uh, more commonly is actually post filter. So they do, they, they do the nearest neighbor search, they return maybe a thousand results. Maybe they want only 10 in the end, but they hope that if they apply the filters to the, to the thousand, they would remain with at least 10 results. Uh, and uh, and uh, that's what they use in production. Uh, needless to say, that's logically broken and oftentimes you're left with nothing. But more often than not, you're just wasting a lot of resources doing that because you've now just created a very, very heavy step in the beginning that is not necessarily uh, the right thing to do. Uh, Pre-filtering is the other approach where you, you start by filtering the results first to a subset of things that meet the logical predicate uh, and only look for the nearest neighbor in them. But that nullifies the structure of the index. So now your index doesn't do anything anymore. Now you just have a set of vectors to look at uh, and that uh, uh, that is horribly inefficient. And so what we are doing uh, and uh, uh, what uh, needs to be done is to actually be able to mesh those two things together and be able to do really metadata and vector search uh, kind of woven into the, the same index structure. So they actually operate efficiently together. Uh, I'll switch gears a little bit about the uh, kind of the structure of the index uh, is kind of laid out on disk and memory and so on, and how a vector database break even more patterns of, of, of other databases that exist out there. <clears throat> First of all, we have um, we have this like geometric uh, uh, kind of content based uh, sharding and layout on disk that maybe uh, is kind of like a like a geospatial data set, a ge geospatial database or uh, but but commonly like it's not time based or just random sharding. It's like it's it's very uh, it's it's very data dependent on which thing goes where, which data which uh, record or data point goes into which uh, cluster shard or or partition. Not partition in the sense like a database partition, like a a, a part. Uh, second of all. The data itself is, is huge. So uh, a record is not some, uh, some small JSON. A record is, could, could be a thousand floats with maybe a kilobyte of, of uh, metadata. Uh, uh, and that is the object that you have to deal with. And so it's not like blob storage, or it's not megabytes, but it's not tiny either. So these are kind of mid-sized uh, objects that you have to schlep around and, and deal with. And that creates, that kind of makes, uh, it kind of breaks a lot of assumptions in, in other database design uh, design patterns. Um, the uh, the indexing itself. So now when you have those partitions, now you want to create the index. The index is not some append to a to a uh, to inverted index. Uh, it's not you know building a B tree or something like that. It's an incredibly computationally heavy process. So you, you compute clustering and you 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 know you, uh, uh, you compute regressions and you know it's it's those are heavy enough that they are actually delegated to GPU sometimes. So the the creating of the index looks a lot more like I'm running some very heavy machine learning training process than it is like a like a quick uh, like uh, you know. Uh, tallying of, of, of uh, properties or just sorting or, or organizing. And to top everything off, uh, you unfortunately have to deal with OLTP like point updates. So it's not even like it's just a pure append. Yes, there's a lot of just append or heavy append heavy operations, but there are a lot of use cases where what you have to do is, is point updates and, and many of them. So people, you just update your uh, um, vector representation of an object. Uh, think about a uh, recommendation engine where uh, where somebody views something or, or says say that they uh, they rate something very highly, then you want to really uh, update your 
representation of their preferences, which will immediately reflect the, the, the next things that might be uh, recommended. And so that, that, that is reflected by you updating the, the vector representation. Uh, and so that, that is a very uh, update heavy process. And what, what do these no, blocks I, represent? Like, what do the different colors represent? These are blocks. Oh, so of data different or colors or? are just so different colors are. Uh, think about them as like uh, uh, parts of these, like uh, maybe roughly corresponding to uh, maybe these clusters. Okay. Okay. So these are uh, you know think about them as. Uh, uh, okay. Chunks. Yeah. Partitions. Chunks, yeah. Chunks of geometrically like a co uh, a co accessed uh, uh, records. So the kind of how you want to lay out things on, on this. Make sense? Yeah, thank you. All right. So, um, all right. So if, if this wasn't already breaking enough patterns, then um, while the updates are OLTP-like, the queries are actually OLAP-like. And so these vector databases, um, uh, the indexes are approximate. And so what they do is they don't actually pinpoint exactly what needs to be retrieved, but rather they give you a set of candidates. And if you remember, I told you uh, there's these like scan operations that you pinpoint a subset of the clusters you want to look at. That's that fraction is huge. It's not you're not looking at one or two clusters. You're looking at maybe 10 percent or 5 percent of the entire data. Right. And within that five or 10 percent, you have to scan. And so the query itself is actually very scan heavy, very CPU uh, compute heavy, okay? Um, which uh, uh, generates, uh, which actually generates candidates. So it doesn't actually pinpoint exactly the items you wanna retrieve, but rather it generates maybe thousands of, of candidate points. So these are candidate matches to which you actually have to go and fetch the metadata in raw vectors. And first of all, verify that they actually match the condition as you have suspected. Of course, uh, you know, not returns, not returns the one that don't, but then you have to return the metadata and the vectors themselves to the users as a part of the result, uh, if they so ask. So there's a second stage of a, you know, a multi-fetch, uh, sometimes for thousands of records. And you remember those, those are not small records in real time. And all of this needs to conclude in, in uh, 50 to 100 milliseconds on, uh, you know, on, on, on a lot of data. Um, I'll wrap up by saying that, uh, you know, just touching on, on the, you know, kind of very high level architecture that I'm, I'm not gonna uh, uh, dive into because this is becoming a little bit more standout on how you now manage a fleet of such indexes uh, and in database instances on, on uh, public cloud, separate storage and compute and facilitate snapshotting and recovery and, and uh, dynamic load and dynamic uh, rescaling and so on, uh, relying on a lot of uh, really good cloud infrastructure that, that uh, really offloads a lot of you know, difficulties uh, uh, to other tools. And so we can focus on, on the stuff that we actually do well while giving a very uh, uh, you know, highly performant uh, uh, you know, and and, uh, uh, and stable, uh, you know, uh, service. So I, I'll wrap up by saying that we are not uh, even remotely done. Uh, I started by saying, looking at these like uh, linear classifiers or like top products or balls or, you know, cosine similarity, you can generalize this to any machine learning model. We're not even close to being able to do that. By we, again, I talk about the community, like nobody knows how to do it. Uh, learning query distributions. Uh, we know that in traditional databases that already helps. You can, you can learn the skew of your queries and optimize the index to do those better, especially in OLAP, like, uh, 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 databases and OLAP in the sense of uh, 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 not in terms of the scan, but in terms of uh, the uh, uh, aggregation, metric aggregation, and, and so on. Uh, very efficient there. Uh, uh, here also, um, we can uh, retrain and refine, and we can actually change the vector representation on the hood uh, uh, to to produce better results and we can measure that. Um, and again, a wide open area for research. 
improving database vector uh, vector indexes themselves. Uh, you know, there there are again tens and hundreds of published papers and algorithms and open source software. Uh, I can tell you that they all leave a lot to be desired, and we're not even close to being able to deal with things like concurrency and and uh, read write uh, safeness and and uh, lock lock free structures and you know, we're still very much in the early days uh, in the sense that people mostly care about the size of the index and maybe the throughput. But, you know, there's this community, I don't need to uh, uh, sell the idea that that is not even remotely enough when you need to run something at scale and with like concurrent read and writes and, in, in, you know, in, in the wild. Um, of course, optimizing storage hierarchy is better now, you know, with the cloud, that's not only, you know, caches and memory and, and disk, you know, you have many types of disk, you know, in different distances from, from the machine and all the way up to like, uh, like, like S3 and blob storage. And so you really have to be able to degrade between those uh, gracefully. Uh, specialized hardware, we have uh, companies developing anywhere from GPUs to like literally specialized chips that just do this. Uh, and we have to figure out if and when uh, those should be used. Uh, auto embedding of complex data like text and images and so on, and the list continues. I can I can talk about each one of those for you know too long. Um, that's it. Uh, I'll, I'll put the plug that uh, you know this you know we are uh, all very excited uh, uh, about about this space. Uh, I'm actually joining this call with uh, Ram, uh, our VP Engineering. Uh, I, I hope uh, he'll be able to answer some of the hard questions that you uh, loop at me. I think Greg, our VP marketing, is, is also here. Uh, uh, and uh, that's it. Okay, awesome. I will clap on half of everyone else. Thank you so much. Actually, quick question. The logos there are what? Your investors or where you run? Or like, how should I understand that? No, no, sorry. Those are, uh, yeah, that's, I, I, I should have spent more time uh, putting the slide together. It's more about, uh, it's, it's kind of where people on the team came. From. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I will open it up to the audience. If you have any questions for Ido, please unmute yourself and go for it. Otherwise, I, I will be selfish and use all the time. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, so, so you showed all these these ways to do di different sort of you know the, the vector indexes. I mean, you started with the, the again the, the LS at LSH, and then a bunch of different things, and then you said that like you do all of the above, and so does that mean you have like this Uber data structure that incorporates techniques from all of these, or if someone says like you know build me an index, you you create all of them, and then at runtime you figure out which one to use based on what the query is. How should I understand this? So uh, no, so right now. Uh, so we, we do two different things. So first of all, we have our own index and data structure that, uh, uh, that uh, provides a really good balance between all the, all, the, all the properties that we care about. It's very highly optimized, has all the filtering and everything inside of it. So we incorporate ideas and solutions from those literatures and algorithms and have our own vector index that has all the properties that we need. We also have integration with open source so that you know, if somebody is really like uh, super gung ho about a specific uh, index from FICE and they have some huge data set and that happens to perform, you know, ten percent better for them, and maybe they don't need these other, you know, functionalities, then we can integrate that as as uh, as the index under the hood. Does that make sense? But you have to choose an yeah. upfront. I mean, it's, you don't change an index a lot, like mid flight. If that's what you're asking. Okay. Or have many of them yes. running concurrently. Okay. So, so I guess repeat what you're saying. You have your own proprietary index data structure you guys build, but then you also pound and include whatever the, the Facebook one is or whatever else is out there. And right. then someone says, all right, index, index the, the, the data set of dog faces. Uh, they have to declare ahead of time exactly what index type they want to use. Correct. And, correct? and yeah, right. And um, um, that is now uh, not uh, yet available on the on the on the free tier, or the actually okay. not even on the not free tier, uh, but the public uh, offering. Uh, yes. This is uh, right now kind of more of an advanced 
feature that like very, very large customers can really uh, leverage. Yeah. Again, because uh, it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, people know so very little about how to operate those indexes and what, what their choices actually mean that yep. they, it, it's incredibly easy to shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, and so we're, we're trying to protect against that a little bit. Okay. All right, so I, we have questions in the chat. I mean, Stephen Moy, do you, you want to go for it? If you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yes, go for it. Yeah, very interested. Thank you for the talk. I wanted to understand how is this different from PsyDB? Because PsyDB also say, oh, they're a vector database. I want to kind of hear it from your perspective. Um, so I have to say that I don't know PsyDB. Um, if Ram so, is on the call. Yeah, yeah. I can I can maybe take a quick uh, stab. Um, so we aren't, we aren't necessarily optimizing for point retrievals of vector coordinates and things like that, right? So while we are a vector database, we are more about semantic search and kind of similarity between vectors and things like that. That is really what this whole thing is optimized for. So we aren't necessarily optimized for retrieving, say, a few coordinates from vectors or doing kind of those sort of scans and things like that. I think SciDB is also trying to do uh, manipulation, like dot, you know, dot products and, and like you know manipulating the the the, ma the matrix within the data system itself rather yeah. than pulling it out to R. Um, yeah. And, but, but I don't know whether they have the sort of similarity search stuff built in. Yeah, not yet, I think. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Um, and I, I used to, to Steven's point, uh, you know, you're talking to Davis Krause, so and this is going to come up. So you, you got you to know the other databases out there. Uh, 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 yeah, yeah. I, I'm, uh, that's why I have rum here, because I'm, I'm a scientist in algorithm. Uh, uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm more on the machine learning and algorithm design and so on. Uh, yeah. And so I know, uh, yeah. yeah. By the way, I think, <laughs> so Andy, Andy, I, I don't remember this, but wasn't, uh, was SciDB the one uh, from Stonebreaker? Um, I think yes. it was like, an, yeah, okay, got it. It was um, TileDB and, and SciDB are both from, from Mike. Yes, um, yes. And then, but as far as I know, I mean, there's a, there's a company backing it called Paradigm 4. I, I, SciDB project might be dead. I, I don't know. I haven't, I never worked on that. I don't know what's going on. Interesting. Um, but TileDB is active, right? Stop us, give a talk with us a few, few weeks ago. Done. Yep. All right, Vipal, you want to ask your question? If he's still here, or you left? He's there. I'm oh, sorry, V roll. Sorry, no P. Hey, hi. Uh, so I think uh, something which I had asked before. So, look, as a, as a customer who is using your product, uh, how how do you like you know make sense of like what kind of evaluation metrics we use and how coupled is it to the ranking layer uh, like finally you know the ranking layer defines what kind of metrics you know in, impact that that a product can have so curious how do you how do you work with your with the customers at, 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 an, at an interface level uh, yeah um i i can take it but ram do you do you want to do you want to take a stab yeah, yeah, by the way, uh, I think uh, Viral, just to answer your other question as well, uh, quickly. Um, there is broadly LSH, the graph based algorithms that Ido pointed out, and also the product quantization and so on. Uh, all of these algorithms have different trade offs in terms of kind of accuracy, speed, and things like that. So when we create benchmarks, we try to create benchmarks that uh, not just look at accuracy or recall uh, at, a, at a particular K, but also things like uh, ingest throughput, query latency, and things like that. Uh, customers care about all, all of these three. The general problem here is all these algorithms are, uh, I mean, the, their accuracy and recall depends on data, right? It depends on the characteristics, characteristics of the data set. So where we are at right now is, there's a large class of public data sets on which we can run benchmarks and we do run benchmarks. One of the things we are starting to do is uh, also run benchmarks on customer data sets. This is uh, in progress, it's not there yet, right? But uh, since customers do ingest data with us, we can run benchmarks for them, right? And uh, right now we don't do that. We kind of leave it up to them to do. So we provide them the 
you know, the APIs and so on, and they can run their own benchmarks. But one of the things we are trying to do is also kind of automate that process, but we aren't there yet. So today we, we have a whole bunch of public data sets on which we run benchmarks. Uh, does that answer so, your question? I mean, zero, sorry, did you answer your question? Sorry. Uh, so, got it. So I think what you're, what you're referring to is, I think there are some system metrics, but then the, the, the metric you're referring to is recall at top K or something like that. We call it top K and a few other metrics that people care about around ranking. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but uh, you know, may, maybe to, to uh, uh, add to that, um, what Ram was saying is, is, uh, is that what people know how to measure and what they measure ends up, in my opinion, being, in our opinion, being uh, severely lacking. So there's like read write and just speeds, you know, there's like a lot of different uh, performance uh, profiles that we really care about. Now we know what customers really care about, but incredibly hard to replicate and be able to actually regress against and so on. So um, uh, that that's a performance and, and uh, kind of behavior characteristics, but there's also the, um, the metrics of, of, of how do you evaluate the set of results uh, we are in some sense like a search engine in the sense that people take get a subset of results out and they want to use that and they can uh, kind of try to assess how good the results are, right? Uh, and for that, people use uh, recall as a surrogate of quality. Uh, but I can tell you that recall is actually a very poor surrogate of quality. And so we also have to have another set of just like data science and a kind of a real world metrics on how good you know how good is the set of results compared to the best that you could do uh and you know again the the, the community has settled on recall but i can tell you that it's a pretty poor uh surrogate of quality in, in many many scenarios uh, and again we, we have of course more than we measure with that and, and many more thank you yeah so, I mean, this gets back to maybe the, the thing you mentioned before about like, I understand that you're doing this on private data, but someone could replace your 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 custom data structure with with the, the Facebook one. Um, I guess this, this gets to the point of like, you know, which one should you use? Depends on many factors, I get that. Um, but we even with, in, in you know, the pine cone specific custom data structure, I'm assuming there's a bunch of different hyper parameters you could, you could, you could tweak about how it slices and dices the data, right? Correct, but but uh, uh, by design, very very few. Uh, uh, I mean that that's okay. the whole. I mean that's a big part of what we uh, try to do is that we really don't. We, we no, don't. No, so I, I, go on. You don't you don't want to expose those hyperparameters to the users because users have no idea, right? Like I, I get that, but like. But what we I also ourselves we also ourselves don't want to rebuild like many indexes and just figure out oh we use the wrong parameters because we. have trained the whole thing and tested it and, oh, we need to, you know, turn the knob, you know, from eight to yeah. nine. Uh, that will also be very expensive. So the design of the algorithm itself is such that uh, we are, you know, incredibly uh, uh, <laughs> resistant to creating these like arbitrary knobs. Uh, but your, but your, your, your point is, is, is taken that, uh, I think the point you're trying to make is that uh, with those open source parameters and even with our our index, there must be at least something you you, you need to tune or 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 uh, or. Uh, uh, no, but 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 I, I wasn't thinking. Oh, you should, you should run your own optimizer to figure these things out. I'm actually like okay. the index themselves. It it's the compute side. That's the expensive part, right? Or is is it reading the data? What's the most expensive part of building the index? Oh, like, it's, it's, could you okay. bit, go ahead. It is. It's very. Uh, it's very compute heavy. Yes. It's. It's. Uh, okay. It is compute. Yeah. And reading the data. And again, it really depends on the index. You know, if you're trying to index, if you're trying to use a uh, HNSW, this is like the multi-layer graph that I yeah. showed you. Uh, that on a million point can easily run for an hour on a pretty beefy machine. No problem. I mean, uh, it's just okay. just uh, you know just just creating the index. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, a very, you know, throughput, right throughput optimized index might go through the whole thing in like, whatever, like a second and a half, right? So this is, we're right. talking about like a zoo of algorithms and options that, that you really have to consider. And that's why I said it's, it's really easy to shoot yourself in the foot if you don't know what you're doing. You can just set the parameter, just replace the name of a, 
of an algorithm and suddenly the whole thing grinds to a halt or just you get some complete garbage out. Um, yeah, uh, it's... it's uh, but what, what, what I'm getting at is like, like whatever makes sense that we're pinecone at some point exposes a single logical index interface to the customer, but underneath the covers, they're maybe, maybe maintaining multiple physical ones at the same time. And then there's some kind of internal optimizer that can decide, oh, for this type of query the person's asking for, I know I want this index versus that index. Exactly. Exactly, I mean, meaning you, you guys do want to do this or you are doing this? We do want to do it. Okay, okay. It's hard. So I'm not saying like, oh, okay, we'll get, yeah, get it together. Yeah, I mean, it's not, yeah. it's not built yet, but it's definitely something yeah. we, we, yeah, it's something we do definitely want to do and keeping keeping the APIs incredibly simple is, is definitely a high priority for us. Okay, um, so my, my next question is like, after you do the index lookup, you had in some of your slides that you show, you do the index lookup and then you blast out a bunch of these point query lookups to the actual data itself. Is there anything special you're doing there or is it because it's S3, maybe you do some batching, but there's not, not really much any, you know, you don't know what the actual layout of the data is on disk. You can't really optimize for that. So today we kind of treat it as two separate things. So for example, uh, we treat the vector and metadata for the last stage of the, of the ranking as like a highly optimized key value store. That's kind of how we lay it out. Whereas okay. the index is optimized for scans. So it's, these are two separate things that are orchestrated together. So you can think of the last stage as just a fancy key value store. But, it, but that means that means you're basically going to take advantage of any locality. Like right? two things. Yes. Because, again, two yes, things that, that, that could be actually. Yes. That's that's actually a great great point. Uh, one of the things we are working on is kind of uh, sorted data structures within that store, so that uh, you can you don't have to do a key value multi get, but actually you can do fast scans because you'll, you'll be scanning like a small amount of data at that point. We today we don't do that. Uh, we still manage to get reasonable performance with just treating it as a key value store, so to speak, because we are retrieving only about order thousand sort of keys, but you're hundred percent right. We can get far more efficient with scanning uh, if, you had, if you sorted. Yep. Got it, okay. Um, I guess two, two, two more quick, quick questions. One's more of a pie in the sky question. Like, I mean, I, you didn't show really what the interface looked like other than like, hey, look, build this index, query the index. But like, you could have a declarative language that looks sort of like SQL, you know, maybe using something that like UDFs or there's a the thing from TimescaleDB, DB, you'd have extensions to Postgres, but now you yeah. allow you to do like that, that pipelining thing. You could yeah. imagine something like that for you guys as well, right? Yeah, I think, I think SQL is probably, uh... I don't think SQL is the issue. Meaning, you can you can express this as SQL, right? In fact, you can express yeah. nearest neighbor search as SQL. the The difference is only in how the index gets built and how things get kind of how 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 the optimizer kind of comes up with the physical execution plan, right? But yeah, I think everything we we talked about here could be expressed as SQL. You know, in some ways though, actually, take back, maybe I take back what I said. Like, if you then give SQL, people are like. Hey, why can't I do this? Like whatever random SQL function they want to do in your data, and they they start treating you like something that you shouldn't be doing, and you get down, you go down a rabbit hole you shouldn't do, and you should just focus on exactly. the thing you guys are good at. So yeah, so maybe exactly. SQL isn't the right thing. Yeah, exactly. That's it. that's okay. exactly why we didn't go the SQL route because that opens up the database for so many other things that we don't necessarily want to, want to be or are good at. Yeah, but then again, like you. I'm not saying they're going to do this, but like the, the redshifts or the snowflakes of the world could say, okay, now we support these, uh, you know, vector embedding indexes on your existing, you know, snowflake data. Um, but maybe because it's so computationally expensive to, to build, and you obviously, you know, you need somebody like like Guido has been working on this for for, for years to know how to make sense of it. Maybe that they're not a threat. Yeah, hundred uh, yeah, percent. I think. I think, I think it's a, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's. Yeah, I don't think it's a threat in the sense that uh, uh, I, I believe, like I guess you guys, that uh, there's a reason why we have a lot of different databases. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's like they're, they're super specialized to whatever you know. And yes, if you have whatever, if you have like uh, you know ten thousand points, uh, like a data chunk, 
it doesn't really matter what you do. You can put it in any database. You can use it as a flat file. It, you know, you can, yeah. you, can just, you can do whatever the hell you want. You don't need a database. When you get a billion vectors, you're going to see, you know, it's going to, it's going to be, you know, uh, 200 milli versus, uh, you know, uh, 30 seconds or whatever, like an hour or whatever. I don't yeah. know. It's, it's, it's going to be heavy. I, I was going to say too, the fact that you, you've never heard of SciDB, even though you're a, a founder of a vector database or startup, Means that like it's still very early in this market space. So if you know you're not on for now, you're not on Amazon's you know radar, which is a good thing for now. You, you can build it up. Okay. So my last question before you go, I'm surprised you didn't say this. Is there any any sort of deep background or uh, or story behind why the name Pinecone? Um. So uh, it's not very deep in the sense. Yeah, it's not very deep. It's just uh, uh, if you look at our logo, then maybe it'll explain it. But yeah, uh, I mean, yeah, I get that, but like, uh, if it's if it's just a logo, that's fine. No, no, it's not the you know, it's uh, I find uh, pine cones to both be kind of geometrically kind of appealing and and kind of uh, you know, it's it's both complex and simple and in the same time kind of abundant and obvious in the same time. There's something about the complexity and the simplicity of it that I, I felt like uh, uh, is something that we're striving for, but it's it's not deeper than that. No, that's a that's a great answer, right? You need you need to like you know ham it up or like build it up a bit more. Like, I'm not saying you go to like the stoner route, like, hey man, if you look at a pine cone, your mind's gonna be blown. But like, I I would pitch I, I would pitch it that way, right? <laughs> they're deeply complex, but really simple to look at. Everyone understands a pine cone, but they're super hard if you actually think about it. That's how I would go. 